Don't sign now. Don't sign now. sister. There's Vera. There's my nephew. There's Steve-O. Jessica, Vera, Ian. Hey, buddy. Nice to see you, young sir. Nice to see you. Oh, my wife's here. Awesome. I love you too, Jesse. I miss you too. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Let's see my sound. Checking my sound. Yep, yeah, my sound's on. What's up, brother Devin? Good to see you, buddy. What's up, mama? My mom is here. What great news my mom had, huh? Yes. Very happy about that. Mm -hmm. Man, what a blessing when everybody comes together and prays. Brought praise for people. Miracles happen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. See, Keely's here. Brother Marvin's here. Everybody's here. We got Brett. Brett is here. Brett is a balloon artist. He's got some dope balloons. There we go. Andy's here. Carrie's here. Uh, who's that? Anais? Yes. Anais? I don't know how to pronounce your name, but that looks like a pretty name. Let's see. My See, I was quizzing my wife right before we got here. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, what were we, what did we study last time? Oh, we studied the Bible. <laughs> My wife, she's a silly heart. My wife is a silly heart. So uh, last time we talked about the beast, his name, his number, his mark. And his image. And his image. And we uh, learned how to get victory over them. Yes. How did we get victory over them? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. Very good. So today we're going to talk about how do I get to know God? How do I have a relationship with God? And um, before we get started, you know, we're going to ask my viewers to get to know you and how to have a relationship with you. And would you please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to be with us in a double, triple, quadruple portion. And Lord, would you protect us in this space and time from any distractions or any attacks that uh, Satan would have uh, due to distract us from this Bible study. So we thank you again, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that you give us of seeing answered prayers. So we thank you. We bless your holy name, and we, again, we thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, love. Okay, so the Bible study is going to be on getting to know God. And this is a very good Bible study in the context of, let's say you have somebody that you want to share God with, and what are the steps, what are the scriptures that we can use to share God and how can we help lead people into a relationship with the Creator? So we're going to immediately get into the Bible study and we're going to go with the question, how does the Bible say who is God? Right? What does the Bible say who is God? And so, of course, we're going to go directly to the Bible and we're going to start with Psalm 147 verse 5. What does the Bible say about who is God. Psalm 147, verse 5. Psalm 147, verse 5. Almost there. Here we go. I'm going to have to go page by page on this one. I keep missing it. Psalm 147, verse 5. Says this. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. So whoever this God is, his understanding is infinite. We want to understand the backdrop of who God actually is. And see, okay, this is who God is. Now how do I get to understand him? The next scripture we're going to go to is 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 27. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 27. 1 Kings 
chapter 8, verse 27 says this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heavens and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less the house that I have built. So here we see Solomon had built a temple for the Lord. And he's comparing how great God is. And he's saying, not the earth, not the heaven of heavens, not even the place where God dwells is able to contain God. And he's saying, how much more is this little tiny temple able to hold your presence? So what Solomon is doing is he's recognizing how massive God is. So we just saw that God's understanding is infinite. It, God's understanding never ends. And he's bigger than heaven and earth combined. Goes on to say this in Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. We're getting to know, in a small way, who is this creator God? Psalm 145, verse 3 says this. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Very important to understand that the greatness of God is unsearchable. Even if you had infinity to search the greatness of God, it would still be unsearchable. So God's understanding is infinite. His, his presence is bigger than heaven and earth, and his greatness is unsearchable. Isaiah 40, 28. The book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28. This is what it says in Isaiah 40, 28. Isaiah 40, 28 says this, Has thou not known... Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary, neither is there searching of his understanding. So here we see a very good picture of who God is. God is the creator. He's the one that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. His understanding is infinite. There is no searching his greatness. And he is bigger than both heaven and earth. So this is the God that we're going to be talking about today. And we kind of got to want to ask ourselves, this God who is infinite, he's, 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 he's forever, he's everlasting, right? How do I get to know this God? Very important. Very important. How can I, a tiny little human being with limited understanding, with limited life experience, with limited wisdom, with limited everything, everything we have is limited. How do I get to know this big and massive and wise and creative and glorious God? How do I do that? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 tells us exactly how we do that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, of them that seek him diligently. Very important to understand that first off, we have to have the faith that God even exists. Now that sounds funny because if we look at nature, we can see the same way as if you just look at a, a, a brick wall. If you were to look at a brick wall, you would say, Somebody had to have created the brick wall. Nobody, the mortar and bricks don't fall in design patterns like that. So too with nature, with the gene code and the way nature is structured, it's impossible for these things to have happened by accident. And God says that if we want to seek him, because he is bigger than what we can think or imagine, and his understanding is infinite, we need to approach this God 
because it is us who is limited. It is us who is tiny and weak. It is us who has the issues. When we approach this, God, we need to do that with faith. That's the number one foundation of getting to know God. We have to have faith. And it goes on to say, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. And that's really one of the most important parts, is that we seek this God, this creator, this one who is infinite in understanding and greatness. It's unsearchable, bigger than heaven and earth. We need to approach this being with faith, and we need to seek him diligently. Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with your whole heart. Very important, very important. And ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with your whole heart. Many people search for God. Many people search for God. Not many people find him. Not many people find him. Because one of the things that as we are looking for God, right, we need to do that with faith. We need to approach God with faith. Because we cannot see him. We cannot touch him. He, he, when we call out to him, he does not answer us back. We need to approach him with faith and we need to seek him with every single thing we have. And when he sees in our heart that that's what we're doing, that we are approaching him with faith and that we're really, truly reaching out for him, he will respond. Now, some people have more strength than others. Some people have more faith than others. It does not take a lot of faith. It did not say ultimate faith. It said we need to approach him with faith. We need to believe it, right? And some people are weaker than others. That's okay. God knows what our limitations are. And he sees when we give everything we have, that's acceptable to him. And then he begins to reveal himself to us. Very important. How do I know which God is the God that is the one that is the true God because there are beings in this universe who try to deceive us and make us think that they're God. Satan does that. Satan is a being in the universe and he wants us to worship him as if he's God. How do I know that the God that I'm searching after is the one and true God? Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. This is what it says. Now hear me out on this one. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in it is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here it clearly says that the creator God is the God of the Sabbath. Very important to understand that we worship the creator God, right? And this creator God is directly associated with the seventh day Sabbath. Very important, very important. And if we take a step back and we don't just look at the fourth commandment, we don't just look at the, 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 the four, uh, seventh day Sabbath. If we look at the 10 commandments in total, Right? We're going to see something very interesting. We're not going to read through all of them. We all know the Ten Commandments, but there's something very important how God starts out the commandments. Let's check this out. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee 
out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, have no other gods before me. So here we see not only is God the lawgiver, not only is God the creator, not only is this deity, the creator, associated with the Sabbath, but he's the one that delivered the children of Israel out of bondage from Egypt. Very important to understand that, that this creator God, this Lord of the Sabbath, is the one who gave us the Ten Commandments. And that's specifically associated with the, um, the, the, the deity that delivered the children of Israel out of bondage from Egypt. As we begin to put all of these pieces together, we begin to narrow the focus of which God is actually the one true God. Very important. Isaiah 45, 21. Isaiah 45, 21 says... Isaiah 45, 21. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else besides me. And just a, a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. Here, Isaiah 45, 21 gives us a very important uh, understanding about God, that this God, this creator God, this God of the law, this God of the Sabbath, this deliverer of the children of Israel from bondage, he's also the savior. He's also the savior God, very important. To understand that as we look at God, we look at the different facets of who he is. And it also said in Isaiah 45, 21, he's the God of prophecy. He's the one that goes and predicts what happens at the end from the beginning. He clearly said here, who is it that can tell you what happens before it takes place? None, no other God. I am the one that does that, right? And he goes on to say that I'm the savior God. So here we see this God that we're looking for, that we're going to search for with all of our heart. And we're going to do that by faith. This is the God of the Sabbath. This is the God of creation. This is the God of the Ten Commandments. This is the one who took the children of Israel out of Egypt and delivered them from bondage. This is the Savior God. This is the God of prophecy. Very important to understand which specific God is this? No other God can perform all of these acts except for the one and true creator God. Very important, very important. This is the one true God. He's infinite in power. He's infinite in wisdom. He's infinite in strength. He's everlasting. He's unsearchable. He's holy. He's righteous. He can tell the end from the beginning. And he is the savior God. Very important, very important. How is it even possible how is it even possible that somebody like me, insignificant, nothing, tiny, limited in life, limited in understanding, limited in knowledge, how is it even possible for me to get to know such a mighty and great God? Well, there's an answer to that. There is an answer to that. Let's start with this scripture. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. How is it? that I get to know an infinite power God, one whose wisdom and understanding is unsearchable, the creator, the one who made heaven and the earth? How is it that I, limited in everything that I have, how do I get to know this God? 1 John 7, 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, 8. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Here we go. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Very important to understand. It says, he that loveth not knoweth not God.
God. So how do I get to know God? By loving. Very important to understand that this love, this is not a perverted love. This is not the kind of love that you and I are associated with here in this world. This love is the very essence and the very nature of God. And we're going to talk about this right now. This love, which is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's not a chemical response that triggers when something happens that you like. That's not love. That's a chemical response. That's an emotional trigger that takes place. But this love, which is of God, is a principle. This principle of love is, I consider you more important than I consider myself. That sounds really funny to say that love is a principle and that the principle displayed is making others more important than you make yourself. But this is exactly what God is. God is love. God is the kind of being who makes others more important than he makes himself. And as we look at what love is, and we put that in the context of that the very nature and essence of God is love, that it's a principle of putting others, making others more important than yourself, considering others more important than yourself. And what we want to do is we want to say, does God love me, right? Because it says God is love. Does God love me as an individual? Does God love Brad? Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15. It's the book of Isaiah 49, 15. Now, this is a powerful, this is a very powerful scripture. Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15 says this. Hear me out now. Hear this verse. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yes, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Very important. How does God compare his love for us humans? Well, he looks at a scenario where there is great love, and that is between a mother and a brand new baby. And God says, is it possible for this mother to forsake her brand new baby? For as impossible as that seems, it is possible for a mother to forsake her brand new baby. That's a horrible and wretched thought. I'm sure 99% of people don't even want to think about that. But God says that his love is so great that it's even greater than a mother with her brand new baby. I'm not a woman. I never had a baby. I can only imagine the love that a woman has towards a brand new baby that just grew inside of her. I'm sure that it would be extremely difficult to forsake a brand new baby. And God says that his love for us, for me, for you, is greater than even a mother with her brand new baby. So does God love us? God loves us so much more than even a mother and her child. How do I know? How do I know that God loves me? Very important. There needs to be evidence. It's got to be evidence or else it's just words. John chapter 3 verse 16. John chapter 3 verse 16. John chapter 3 verse 16 says this. John chapter 3 verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the evidence that God loves us. But this, the way we say it, we've gotten so used to saying John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
Let's take this word love, right? For God so loved the world. And let's not use the word love. Let's use the definition, the principle of love. Let's use that, right? Because remember, the principle was considering others more important than yourself. Check this out now. We're not going to use the word love. We're going to use the definition of the word of, of the, the principle of love. Check this out. For God so considered the world more important than he considered himself. This is what love is. For God considered the world more important than he considered himself. That whosoever believeth in him, right? For God considered the world more important than he considered himself, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is how we know God loves us. Because he considered us more important than he considered himself. And he knew the only way for human beings to have their sins forgiven was if he sent his son on a mission to die. God did not have to do that. God could have kept his son safe in heaven and the human beings would have been nothing but a five second blot on the existence of time. But God considered us more important than he considered himself. And he gave his only begotten son that we should have our sins forgiven. Very important. Very important for us to see God loves us and God considers us more important than he considers himself. So much more important that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that he did whatever God the Father did whatever it took. God the Father did whatever it took to save us. God the Father did whatever it took to save us. Including giving his most precious thing he had. God considered us more important than he considered himself. And he gave his most precious thing that he had, which was his son. So the secret... This is very important. The secret to getting to know God the Father is by getting to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the key to getting to know God the Father is by getting to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6 says this. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Very important to understand that if we want to get to know who the Father is, right? That's God. That's the creator. That's the one everlasting, infinite in wisdom and knowledge, bigger than heaven and earth, right? If we want to get to know God, we have to go through his son because Jesus says there is no way. He is the way. He is everything when it comes to getting to know God the Father. Now we got to ask ourselves, why? Why do we need to go through Jesus? Why can't I go on my own? Why do I have to go through Jesus? John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. You see, Jesus is the very Word of God. And it's through the word that God created everything. And God did something very, very special with his word. John chapter 1 verses 14. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory as the as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus is the very word of God. He's the captain of the host of the armies of heaven. Look at Revelation 19. It gives a full description of Jesus in his glory. He's the word of God. He's the captain of the host of the armies of heaven. And God took his word and put it inside of a human body so that Jesus could go through the human experience and he's then able to give us the opportunity to live the life that he lived and he's able to be the sacrifice we need to have to have our sins forgiven. Very important that Jesus is the very word of God and so to have a relationship with somebody, what do you need to do? You need to exchange words with them. We need to go to God's word and have a relationship with God through his word. Very important. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 says this. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, we're talking about Jesus. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, and the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. God the Father had prepared a very special body for Jesus. Now, when I say special, I mean in the context that Jesus took upon himself a, a sinful human body. And so Jesus had to go through all the th same things that we went through. And as he overcame sin by submitting his will to the Father, he became victorious over Satan and then offered his life on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if I want to get to the Father, I need to go through Jesus, who is the very word of God. Very important. Very important. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. This is what it says. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Very important to understand, Jesus is the creator. God the Father had Jesus create all things, and all things were made for Jesus and through Jesus. And it's very specific when it says this, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So how do human beings, how do angels get to know this God who's infinity and wisdom, bigger than heaven and earth, who is... Um, understanding and greatness is unsearchable, we go through his word, we go through his only begotten son who is the image of the invisible. Very important, very important. John 14, seven and nine. This is what Jesus says about getting to know God the Father. This is what Jesus says about getting to know God the Father. John 14, seven and nine. A little backdrop. Jesus is um, having uh, a conversation with the disciples. And the disciples begin to tell Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father and it will satisfy us. They don't understand the question that um, they just uh, posed to Jesus. Show us the Father and it will, they don't understand the statement, right? Because anybody to look upon the Father will perish. Right? They're, not, they're not processing the, the, the scriptures properly. And so here we see Philip say to Jesus, Jesus, 
Show us the Father and it will satisfy us. And this is Jesus' response. Here we go. Uh, John 14, 6. Well, sorry, it's 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me but by the... Uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from this moment on, you know him and have seen him. Here we go. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it satisfies us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Very important. To understand that the life that Jesus lived, that the sacrificial life that Jesus lived, the healings, the, the, the time spent with people who were lost, how Jesus loved them, his, all, the whole life of Jesus was to reveal the love of the Father. And when Philip came to Jesus and said, show us the Father and it will satisfy us, Jesus was disappointed because he knew what he had been trying for years and years to teach the disciples had um, gone over their head. Everything that Jesus did from his perfect life to his prayer life to uh, every healing, uh, every scripture that he read on the Sabbath was to show the love of the Father. And when we look at Jesus, we see the Father. Very important. This is what Jesus says in John 16, 27 and 28. John 16, 27 and 28. John 16, 27 and 28. For the Father himself loves you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I come out from God. I am come forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So here Jesus is giving us proof that God the Father loves us. And when we love Jesus, when we accept God's word by faith, that sacrifice, what Jesus did, right? We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The blessing of forgiveness comes upon us. And when God looks at us, he sees his son. Very important. And Jesus goes on to say here that he has to leave and go back to the Father. This is part of an understanding of having a relationship with God. Is why did Jesus have to go? Why did Jesus have to go? John 14, verses 1 through 3. Why did Jesus have to leave us? If we are to have a relationship with God the Father... And we need to do that relationship through Jesus. Why did Jesus have to go? John 14, verses 1 through 3. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where? Why did Jesus have to leave? Because he went to go prepare a place for us. Very important to understand. Jesus had some things to do in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus is our high priest, Hebrews 8 and chapter 9. And it says that in the heavens, there is a heavenly sanctuary, which is a, 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 the, the sanctuary that was on earth. That was simply a copy of what the heavenly sanctuary was like. Jesus is our high priest, and he took his blood into the heavenly sanctuary to minister in the heavens. He's gone to prepare a place for us important job what Jesus is doing. He had to go um, to do that job. Very important that he went to, to take care of this. John 16, 7 and 8. John 16, 7 and 8. 
John 16, 7 and 8 says this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is important. It is very important for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. You see, Jesus had to go away so that he could give us the Holy Spirit. Because it wasn't until Jesus was glorified in heaven on the day of Pentecost, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, when Jesus was glorified by God the Father, he then had access to give us the Holy Spirit, which then gives us the mind, the life, and the righteousness of Christ. And it was very important for this to take place, for the sanctification process to happen through the believers of Jesus. This is very important. This is why Jesus had to go, so that he could send us the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26. John 15, 26 says this, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Very important to understand that it's through the Comforter, through the Holy Spirit, that we learn of who Jesus is. Check this out. It says, but when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall tell you of me. So how do I get to know the Father? I get to know the Father through the Son. How do I get to know the Son? Since he's in heaven doing his work as a heavenly high priest? Well, that is done through the Holy Spirit. I get to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the guide of all truth. This is very, very, very important. How do I get to know Jesus? Well, it's a combination of two things, right? It's a combination of two things. We know one of those things is the Holy Spirit. What's the other thing that I get to know Jesus by? John 17, 17. John 17, 17. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. Very important to understand that the Bible is the truth. The Bible is the thing that tells us about Jesus. Remember what we read in Hebrews where Jesus, um, where Paul is quoting the Psalms and he says, lo, it is written of me in the volume of the book, right? The volume of the book, those things that are written about Jesus in the volume of the book is how we get to know him. And Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us through the scriptures so that we can get to know Jesus and have a proper relationship with him. John 16, 13. John 16, 13 says this. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Very important to understand that it's true. We have the Bible which testifies of Jesus. But it's just as important that we have the Holy Spirit in our life to show us the truth about Jesus. Now, in this world, Satan has done a deception and he has caused many Jesuses to rise up. And not every Jesus is the Jesus of the Father. There are many Jesuses out there in the world. And it's the Holy Spirit who guides us in this and shows us how to have a relationship with the true Jesus. Very important that the Holy Spirit guides us in the truth, guides us in the word. The Holy Spirit reproves us of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts our heart of sin. The Holy Spirit helps us to walk in uh, righteousness by giving us the mind, the life, the righteousness of Christ. And the Holy Spirit helps us make godly judgments. 
This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the main work to, to, to develop in our walk a true relationship with Jesus. And as we develop a true relationship with Jesus, according to the scriptures being led out by the Holy Spirit, we then go through that narrow gate, which leads to the Father. Very important to understand that if we want to get to know God, we're going to have to go through Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is our guide in that relationship through the scriptures. As we get to know the scriptures, we get to understand who Jesus is, what he did for us, what he expects from us. And as we go down that road, the Holy Spirit gives us a, a heart that will convict us of sin. He'll help us make good, godly judgments. And he'll keep us on the road of the straight and narrow, giving us the strength to live a righteous life. Very important that the Holy Spirit's job is to do this, to give us the mind, the life, the righteousness of Christ. And it's very important, very important to have the combination of the scriptures with the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the scriptures with the Holy Spirit, you are going to go down a road of deception. If you have simply the scriptures without the Holy Spirit to convict you of righteousness, to convict you of sin, and to help you make godly judgments, you're going in your own strength and you're going you're gonna to go down the road that feels good. That's a fact. If you don't have both the scripture and the Holy Spirit, you're going to become an unbalanced Christian and you are going to, one, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're going to read the scriptures according to your own uh, opinions and you're going to go down a road that is not godly. If you have a spirit, quote unquote spirit, and you don't read the scriptures, then you're going to be constantly relying on feelings and you're going to tell people that they're idolaters for spreading the three angels message. You're going to say a whole bunch of inappropriate stuff that is completely unbiblical because you're going by what you feel is the Holy Spirit. Very important to understand that it has to be a combination of this, the word with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why does it have to be a combination of both? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Very important to understand that the Holy Spirit was needed to write the scripture. The Holy Spirit was needed to write the scripture. How much more is the Holy Spirit needed to understand the scripture? Very important that the Holy Spirit was needed to write the scripture. That's the mind of God. The mind of God was needed to write the scripture. How much more do we need the mind of God to explain it to us? Very important. Cannot have one without the other. We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand the scripture because the Holy Spirit was needed to write the scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17 says this. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It's in the scriptures that we find wisdom unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's exactly what Hebrews eleven six said. We can, it is impossible to please God without faith. And here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, and from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Salvation, the God of salvation, that we receive that through faith. We receive that wisdom through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's the same as 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 
the holy men of God wrote as the Holy Spirit guided them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Very important to have both the Holy Spirit and the Word of God because the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And as we're reading the Word, as we go and seek God with our whole heart, everything that we have, and we do this by faith, God will look into our heart and say, this one's really trying. Let's give him the Holy Spirit and guide him in all truth. Very important that it's God who looks at the heart and it's God who sees who's really being sincere in his search for him. And this needs to be done through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit. And when we're reading the scriptures, the Holy Spirit will guide us to a knowledge of Christ, which is able to make us wise unto salvation. And then the Holy Spirit will reprove our hearts of sin. They'll convict our heart of sin. And then they'll help us make good godly judgments and help us to walk in righteousness. That's what 2 Timothy 3.16 is all about. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for uh, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we may live lives that are pleasing to God. Right, And when we want to have a relationship with the Father, we need to go through Jesus Christ. And as we approach Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given unto us so that as we investigate the scriptures, we'll learn what it takes to have a proper uh, relationship with Jesus. Very important. So we come to God by faith because that's the only way that pleases him. And as we get to know this infinite, all-powerful, all-wise God, this takes place when we do it with our whole heart. We look at God's love through the Holy Scriptures. We look at God's love through the Holy Scriptures. We see that God considered us more important than he considered himself. We see that in the Holy Scriptures. And as we look at God's love, we see Jesus as we look at God's love, we see Jesus, the Son of God. And as we look at Jesus, we see the life of Christ. We see the teachings of Christ. We see the healings of Christ. We see the sacrificial love of the Father. We see that in Jesus. Because Christ teaches us what the Father is like. If we know Jesus, we know the Father. Christ tells us how much the Father loves us. And as we get to know the Son of God, we get to know who the Father is as well. Yes, Jesus did have to go. Jesus did have to leave this world. But as he left this place to go and prepare us a better place for us, he did not leave us comfortless. He sent the Holy Spirit to us. And this work that Jesus is doing is very important. So he sent the Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth, to convict our heart of sin, to help us make good godly judgments and to lead us in all right, uh, righteousness. And as Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, which is the guide of all truth, the Holy Spirit testifies. The Holy Spirit tells us of Jesus through the Holy Scriptures. The work of the Holy Spirit is to lead us into a relationship with God the Father through the Son. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth and gives us the mind, the life, the righteousness of Christ. Is it possible to know God? It is possible to know God. And as we ponder this idea of getting to know God, we're directed to the Son. And we say, can I know you, God? And you, we can absolutely know God. As we develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the more we get to know about Jesus, the more we get to know about God the Father. This takes place through the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we investigate Scripture. Very important to understand that we can get to have a relationship with God the Father. That takes place through the Son. We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We repent of our sins. We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And when this takes place, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, which is the guide of all truth. 
And as we study the Bible, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us through the scriptures and the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. We develop a relationship with Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, we get to know who the Father is. This is how we have a relationship with God. Very important to understand. Jesus said, there is no other way. Jesus is the very word of God. He comes from the very bosom of God. He came out of God. And so if we want to um, have a relationship with God, we best do the things that he says is right and proper, which is having a relationship with the Son. And that is completely guided by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures. So this is the Bible study for today. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to study the Bible. If you know anybody that um, is seeking to have a relationship with God, share these scriptures with them. You don't, you don't have to share the video. You can share these scriptures. You can lead them to get to have a relationship with God. It's true. We got to do a little bit of writing down. You can share the video. You don't have to. I would say you share with them this information. You be the one that brings Jesus into their life. And you'll receive a special blessing. So um, is it possible to get to know God the Father? It is through the Son. And as we get to know the Son, the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us in that through uh, the scriptures. So that's the Bible study for today. I hope it was a blessing uh, to you. And I'll tell you this, as I got to know Jesus, the more I got to know about Jesus, um, the more I got to know about God the Father, and the more I got to experience the Holy Spirit in my life, and I never, um, never will I ever even think that it was not even worth the time or the effort that uh, the Lord has allowed me to experience. So I want to thank everybody for coming to the Bible study. I love y'all. Okay. So I don't, there's a question that just, Popped up and says, "Is he considering his own writings as scripture?" Yes. What was that? What were they talking about? Well, you're talking about um, the uh, all all scripture is that one. Ah, uh, text Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. Now, the the context behind Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen is that this is the Old Testament because when um, Paul wrote this, there was no New Testament, so all scripture. Uh, given by inspiration of God, is referring to the Old Testament, uh, the law, the prophets, the history, and the poetry. Um, the New Testament is incorporated into the scriptures now, but at the time of the writing of Timothy, um, it, it was referring to the Old Testament. That's not to say that the New Testament isn't uh, just as valid scripture, um, but the mind frame of Paul when he wrote that it was uh, referring to the Old Testament. So I don't know if that helps you. Normally I don't answer questions, but it just, uh, I got stuck on that. And so, um, ready? I'm ready. Okay. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us for Bible study again. Let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could have a relationship with you and that it is not always easy to walk by faith and to read the Bible. Sometimes reading the Bible is hard, God. And so as we come to you, we want to come to you just the way you told us, by faith, with everything that we got. So we're reaching out to you, God. Help us to have a good, strong relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And as we seek to do your will, we ask that you would give us a double, triple, quadruple portion of your Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us. And the more we look at Jesus, the more we will see you. Lord, give us your Holy Spirit to convict our heart of sin, to help us make good godly judgments, and to lead us into all righteousness. Lord, as we pray, we ask a, a special blessing of healing. We ask a special blessing of physical, financial, emotional prosperity of anybody who has watched this or will. And we thank you and praise you again for the blessing that you have given my mother. So as we move forward, Lord, we would just like to ask that you would hold back the winds of strife. Continue your work in sealing our hearts. And if we are sealed, Lord, we ask that you would give us the privilege of helping others get sealed. And so, Lord, continue to hold back that wind of strife so that we can continue to be shaped and molded into your image. And if possible, Lord, 
one more seal. So, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of today, and we just thank you for the, uh, the, the freedom of Internet and Bible. So help us to be a blessing to you, Lord. Help us to walk in spirit and in truth, and help us to go about doing your business. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody.